When I, I, I'm an inveterate drugger of my children. Got a stomachache? Oh, I think I'll give them the Nergen. Not going to sleep? I'll give them the Nergen. Have a reaction to a bite? Give them the Nergen. It's a bloody wonder drug. It really is. It's, it's an incredible drug. Um, I didn't think I'd ever be standing up here um, talking about Finergan and its place in the history of psychiatry. Um, but it does have a pretty amazing place in the history of psychiatry. I don't know, how, how many of you pop the little blue pills? Ever used them at all? They're, they're, they're great, they're really good. You know, I've prescribed them for just about anything. Actually, part of this story comes out of. Um, just before I gave this lecture, um, one of my kids had to go to hospital for a, a, a few days um, because she's got this genetic metabolic condition. And if she um, can't hold food down, if she fasts, she can't meta metabolize her body fats properly. So she has to be stabilized using glucose solutions and stuff like that. And one of the first things that they do um, when they um, admit her into hospital is they give her an antiemetic to try and stop her from vomiting. And, and they've got some pretty amazing ones that you know, they'll only give you when you go into hospital. You, you can't get them through the pharmacist or anything like that. I wish you could. Um, but when she was being treated, I noticed that the nurse had left up her online pharmacopoeia uh, of the different range of treatments that she was looking to treat Scarlett. And up there was Largactyl, which is one of the trade names of for promising use, as we'll see, to treat schizophrenia. And I thought, oh, God, the, the previous patient must have been undergoing uh, a psychotic episode. And I said, oh, having trouble with the full moon tonight, nurse. It, it turned out that she was looking it up as a possibility of using it as an antiemetic uh, on uh, Largactyl. On, on my daughter. So we'll, we'll see. I, I was a little bit shocked and taken aback, and then I thought, no, that, that makes sense. I can see the logic here. Um, so I started digging deeper and then found that we had these enormous connections between phenergin, which is an antihistamine, but also has a nicely sedative uh, properties uh, with the development of uh, chlorpromazine, otherwise known as Largactyl or Thorazine. Now, where all these things initially came from was actually the dyeing industry. That's not dyeing as in killing. This is not Hitler's Holocaust. This is the uh, development, in particular in Germany, of synthetic dyes to dye clothes. Massive breakthrough, huge industry. Very, very important economically in terms of the development of industrialization in Europe, and particularly Germany. Uh, and uh, in particular, BASF, Badisch Anilin und Soda Fabrik, uh, were responsible for developing um, a series of dyes that were based upon a particular molecule. Uh, they had identified the uh, phenothiazines. Are we going pheno or pheno? Oh, I must have someone that's got a bit more pharmacological knowledge in the house than me. If I'm not corrected, I'm going for pheno, uh, which have been developed from coal dyes. Um, this guy, uh, Paul Ehrlich, incredibly important in the development of uh, early um, antibacterial um, uh, medicines. Um, he started experimenting on these. And uh, he noticed that um, there were antibacterial properties to these particular dyes, these dyes used to dye clothes. Um, aniline dye, in particular, led to him to develop this uh, drug, uh, Salvacin, which turned out to be pretty, yeah, fairly effective, the most effective thing by light years that they developed to treat um, syphilis. It was his magic bullet, as it's often called. Um, from this, on the back of this, a whole range of different products were produced. Methylene blue uh, helped develop various forms of um, artificial synthetic um, quinines to treat malaria. Same thing is happening in World War II. 
Um, it turns out that the phenothiazines had these remarkable properties that go way beyond um, um, their ability to either die or be antibacterial. And it's from uh, promethazine um, that the story develops in terms of how, um, how chlorpromazine was developed. Um, what it turned out was that the thenophiazines um, had these incredible antihistamine properties, the ability to deal with the kind of reactions caused by a spike in the histamines that might result from you know, uh, allergic reactions to pollens or to bites or what have you. Um, when we look at vinegar, we, we take drugs like that completely and utterly for granted. But during the 1930s and particularly in the 1940s, they were regarded as one of the most miraculous developments in terms of medicine. Uh, to the extent that the guy that developed Finergan ended up winning the Nobel Prize in 1950. That was how important these were regarded to be. But as with all of these things, the story wasn't just going to stop with the antihistamines because it was noticed um, that this class of drugs had this kind of sedative and calming effect. In particular, um, this individual, Henri Labrie, uh, who was a French army surgeon who had been looking far and wide to try and find drugs that could help cope with shock. Not just the shock from being wounded on the battlefield, but the shock of undergoing the surgery itself. Um, because we know that um, even though you're knocked out, the very fact that you're being cut open and operated upon and you know, all the stuff that goes on with major surgery causes an immense amount of shock in the body. And if you can control that, you can prevent a whole series of operative and post-operative problems. And so he starts looking at the sedative properties of these um, to um, help him in his work uh, in the French army. And he develops uh, a mixture of uh, prom <laughs> promethazine and uh, dolentine into what he called a lytic cocktail um, that he would give to people once they came in off the battlefield or wherever you know, the French are fighting in quite a few places at this time um, Algeria, um, Vietnam or Indochina as it was called at the time uh, and he believes that this and he's got a lot of evidence that this um, helps him with treating these injuries you can see where this is going because he also noticed that um, the sedative effects were such that they appeared to create almost like a pharmacological lobotomy, and that it completely did that thing that Freeman was talking about, the bleaching of effect. Now, we, we move through so many different things here. We, we've gone from the dyeing industry and German industry uh, we've looked at uh, antihistamines, coping with spikes in histamines. Um, we're seeing the side effects from drugs that suddenly start appearing as if they can do other things like help treat shock. Uh, we then see that these drugs used in certain ways replicate for the, uh, a period that they're in the body um, so almost like a pharmacological lobotomy. So it immediately became apparent, or not immediately, um, as these were doing the circle, that these might have some kind of application within the context of mental illness to treat the main disorders like bipolar, um, to use it in terms of developing those kind of sleep therapies um, that we saw earlier with that attempt to induce coma from insulin, these could do the job pretty well, in fact, um, as, as effectively as anything else in terms of putting people under and keeping them under. And uh, it also seemed to be that it might have um, benefits in certain neurological conditions. We still haven't arrived at the point where chlorpromazine has become a, uh, an antipsychotic. 
Um, initially, it is a sedative. Um, you know, we can look at the uh, process here. Um, what happens is they continue uh, Rhone Poulenc um, in um, in France, uh, are continuing to research on the antihistamine properties of phenothiazine, and uh, they're doing all sorts of things. They um, they chlorinate uh, promising. Geez, I've got to do a degree in chemistry or something. I don't understand a lot of how this works. And in chlorinating promising, they come up with chlorpromazine. And initially, what they think it can be used for is um, basically for sedation. Um, it's it's used um, in a you know they they're experimenting using conditioning experiments. This is basically. Know, having an electrified rope with some food placed on a tray at the top and a bunch of rats and the rats run up the rope and get shot and they soon get conditioned not to run up the ropes what happens if you give them a sedative will they just ignore the shock that they're getting because the sedative has kind of made them not care about it or in another case when they were testing this um, you know, get a bunch of um, dogs, um, uh, condition them to vomit whenever someone appears with their food. You do that by sort of just, you know, when the person appears, giving them an injection of, a, of an emetic that will make them vomit. And soon, when the person appears, um, you don't need to give them the injection and they'll vomit. Give them a sedative, see what it does. And when they gave the rats the chlorpromazine, and when they gave the dogs, uh, the chlorpromazine, what they discovered, no more vomiting, seemed to have hugely sedative effects. So it was quite clear from these conditioning experiments, poor dogs, poor rats, um, that um, it had um, the potential um, to be a deeply effective sedative. And indeed, Labery um, integrates it into his lytic cocktails in Vietnam from 1953 onwards and uh, uses it to, uh, to have artificial hibernation in extreme cases when people need to be kept in an artificial coma. Um, what he noticed was uh, in smaller doses, patients were more relaxed. It worked incredibly against the shock of both wounds and surgery. It also had the properties of lowering the body's temperature. Now, um, he decided to name the drug Largactyl. Largactyl to mean broad activity, because it seemed to do all of these things. Uh, gangliolytic, I presume, means, and again you can correct me, that I know that um, sensory nerves usually have a ganglion on them, whereas motor nerves don't go through a ganglion. So the idea of it being gangliolytic is that it's going to in effect dull the senses by operating upon the nervous ganglia within the body and we can see that it can do a whole load of other things as well. Anti-fever, anti-shock, anti-convulsant, great for um, heart conditions, you know it seems to have no end of possible uses. And of course it was inevitable in many respects once they have got to this point noting its sedative properties, that it was going to get integrated into psychiatric practice. It was kind of like a no-brainer by this point. But notice we've gone through this incredibly circuitous path. It's a path that we can see replicated uh, with things like LSD, um, which are, is also being developed at this time for use within the asylums. Uh, René Lariche, um, critical to the story of bringing the drug to market. Uh, what is most original in Labrie's work is the conception he has of therapy for shock. It's frankly revolutionary. Whilst up to now we've tried to reanimate the elements of a life that was dying, is the idea of putting them into a vegetative sleep, of slowing down all the changes, since it's the vegetative reactions that give rise to and maintain shock. And uh, um, running out of time, but basically, um, it, 
it, it took a long time before it was fully integrated into asylum practice. It put um, not clear, it was never clinically trialled. Um, it was just used within different contexts to see how well it worked. Initially rejected in the USA, but it goes through Switzerland, then Europe, and it seems to work in those contexts, into the USA, finally marketed as Thorazine. Um, and uh, marketed initially uh, as an um, uh, as a antiemetic until we see wonderful advertisements like this uh, incorporated into asylum practice by 1955 according to Mark Altschuler um, it's transformed psychiatric practice and it seems to have had uh, an incredible effect in a way that not even things like lobotomy had so, what were the reactions to this? Decline in, uh, in the number of lobotomies. Now they can use drugs like chlorpromazine to affect that. Uh, it seems that patients can be managed more effectively. As this uh, brings in the potential for decarceration. Um, it has to be said as well, it's not all wonder. Um, it has particularly nasty side effects, uh, which even the drugs that have come after it uh, have not been able to um, combat or they have their own particularly nasty side effects as well. Um, this was a comment of uh, one of my friends who's had uh, long-standing um, problems with uh, his uh, mental health and uh, he posted on Facebook to me once, Ligactyl is not a nice drug, you can hear your brain cells pop if you're allowed out in the sun. Um, so, you know, I, I guess in a way, um, you know, it, it, it would be too easy to see this as a miracle um, because ultimately um, there are really nasty side effects that go along with it. At the same time, um, it does seem a lot less drastic than treatments like lobotomy and it does allow the emergence of, um, um, of uh, the movement to decarcerate. 